Okay. So I, I decided to do a, a, a soft start because um, people are still trying to get over here, uh, I'm right. sure. Uh, and, and so I've been running the videos on, um, on the smallest federated wiki, which is part of the technology that, uh, that I'm looking at in, in using this. So uh, my name is David Ng, um, and I'm going to talk about incubating service system thinking. And uh, this has been, I've been working on this for six months, and so this presentation is actually different from the one I gave in Poland last week, and that's different from the one that I gave in, uh, in COSI in June, and different from the one that I gave in COSI in January. So it's, so it's all new. Um, we have enough time today. Uh, I guess we run until 6 o'clock. Uh, but I want to give everyone the opportunity to kind of step through the thinking. And uh, we'll have questions as we go along. If you don't understand, just stop. Um, the, the reason for the, uh, for, for the technical talks I was giving you earlier was uh, the person that was giving that talk was Ward Cunningham, who is the inventor of the wiki. And he figured out that wiki is not what he thought it was going to be, and he's created a new technology. And so we're adopting that as part of the project. Uh, so what happens is that because this gets really deep really fast, um, what I've been doing is, uh, is trying to get enough content up on the web so people don't have to face a blank piece of paper. Um, and, and, uh, and, and hopefully, by example, you can decide amongst yourself whether you like it, don't like it. It's, it's not, I'm trying not to be arm-waving about this, that we should do this, it should do that. I'm trying to enter in conversations with everyone about what, what they might do and, um, and how we might collaborate. So um, in that interest, um, the, uh, I, I'm going to do, um, in the first 10 minutes, I'm going to do what I think service system thinking should be in brief. And from there, uh, we're going to go into conversation for orientation where I talk about some of the history and background of the work that is around, the, uh, uh, around what I think is the foundation of service system thinking. Um, and then there's some conversations or possibilities. I'm trying to separate out the conversations for orientation because I'm trying to make the conversations for orientation mostly historical. The conversations for possibilities are where I think we could take service system thinking. But this is not something that I'm going to do by myself. This is going to be something that a community would work on together. Uh, and, and it's actually going to turn out, I think, to be a very small number of people in the world. It's not something that, um, because uh, as, as looking, it's already, I, you know, I'm running these videos on, on a federated wiki. So how many people actually have written on a wiki? Right? Mm -hmm. so, this thing, so this is a good candidate audience because if you've never written on a wiki and you're scared of writing and editing on a wiki, there's going to be this barricade, you know, this barrier for entry. Um, and so uh, uh, the collaboration tools enable us to be more productive. But if, we do, if people don't do that and they don't use the technologies, they're not familiar with the technology, it slows down the team. So it's going to be this bar. So, so we're going to talk about conversation possibilities a little bit um, uh, about some alternative paths that I think we could take. Uh, the conversations for actions get pretty light because uh, I've been doing some background work and then uh, the future uh, beyond that is uh, uh, we'll see what happens. So I'm going to be switching between a slide deck and, um, and content that's actually on the Federated Wiki right now. So I had written that the, uh, the site that I'm showing the first content um, fed.wiki.org is Ward Cunningham's Federated Wiki. And he started that two years ago. Uh, and and um, Ward Cunningham originally was involved in the uh, pattern language movement. Um, so uh, it, it's good to have him as a foundation. Uh, I've created a website at fed.coevolving.com. Uh, I have instructions, which I'll, to I'll show you later on, um, that people can create their own wikis. It's actually... Theoretically, a one-button install, uh, you know, you log in and do this sort of stuff. Practically, we'll see what happens because we're talking about a, uh, an open source community that's, uh, that, that supports you. So, um, service system thinking in brief, uh, and this is how um, rapid this is. Uh, this, this content was developed as a result of, uh, ha of just being at the uh, International, Work uh, International Symposium in Las Vegas at the end of June within COSI. And so I want to talk about an intentional representation of what service system thinking is, or could be, uh, and also an object process representation, which is something that I got out of the, um, 
uh, of the systems engineering community. So one of two diagrams. So this is the first diagram. Um, in an intentional representation, service system thinking is a resource that can be applied by service scientists, management, engineers, and designers. So this is um, I-star notation. Um, two years ago at the human side of service engineering meeting, Lisanne Lazard, who uh, was at the iSchool at University of Toronto, presented a paper uh, talking about using I-star. I-star is actually uh, an intentional uh, modeling notation language out of the University of Toronto. And so I actually downloaded uh, OpenEME. Uh, I'll explain the tech, uh, let's go over the notation a little bit here, because what they have, uh, a position covers a role, covers an agent, so they have some idea of people here. Uh, here they have soft goals. Um, here they don't actually have hard goals, but soft goals are, are um, non-quantitative, they're qualitative goals. Uh, and they have tasks and they have resources. Those are constructs they have within the I-star language. So what we've got here is I say that we have uh, two parties, uh, up two big parties here. We have the service beneficiary and we have a service provider. Okay, uh, Inside the service beneficiary, uh, we have the, the uh, beneficiary's purposes or interests, which are a soft, uh, a soft uh, goal, as I say in this notation. And what happens is that is, um, what is the notation here? It is um, something, I, I'm not familiar with the notation enough, I'm just, I try, just trying this out. Um, but there's a relationship between soft goals that they have. And so why would they uh, engage here? They, they, ex they expect some portions of joint benefits when they work with a service provider. So there's an the idea of value co-creation here, and there'll be some value on the provider side, there'll be some value on the beneficiary side. Now if we look at the task, what happens is they apply their own resources for other parties. So if we're talking about a service system, we have resources, and the resources here influ influence the resources there, and uh, they have a uh, a resource. So they, they have the task here. The resource is the capacity for systems integration. Okay. Um, now, when you start getting into the notation between this, what happens? And and you start thinking about this again. This is a straw man. So if you have a soft goal, you can't really observe a soft goal in the other party. So I don't know why Michael's here. I don't know why Janet's here. They have soft goals. I don't know. But what they can observe is tasks. And they may be able to observe resources, right? And so, so you see the lines are kind of crossing over here, and, and the I-star notation allows for that. Um, so that kind of covers the two big circles. Now, um, trying to figure out what a service system is, um, the, the four parties that I think we're interested in, and this is related to extending the work that Jim Spohr had done in service science management, engineering, and design, is let's say there's a service scientist, a service manager, a service uh, engineer, and a service designer. Uh, they have, um, and these are Jim Spohr's definitions, what's, what's the service scientist do? Improves understanding, maps natural history, validates mechanisms, makes predictions. What the service manager do? And these are tasks, right? They're not goals, they're actually tasks. Um, service manager improves capabilities, defines progress measures, optimizes investment strategies. The service engineer improves controls, optimizes resources. A service designer improves experience um, and uh, explores possibilities. So if they all have these type of tasks, they're all different. My proposal is that service system thinking should be a resource that they draw on to do those things. Okay. So what, what's happened is that in thinking through and trying to work through um, well, how we should be modeling things, I, uh, I, I'm just following through on Lisanne's paper. Um, she, she introduced this idea of using I-Star two years ago. Uh, she's now at the University of Ottawa. I've been pinging her. I haven't talked to her about it because I haven't had time yet. But this is an interesting conversation about how is she, how is she to be modeling a service system and there's an intentional view to do that. More traditionally, in an object process representation, service system thinking is handled by community. So, so um, at the NCOSI meeting, so ENCOSI has been strongly endorsing uh, SysML as a language, a modeling language, but there is a, a counter to that um, saying that SysML is too complicated, it's, de it's designed specifically for developing things and, and use it for you know, the hardware parts of mobile phones and stuff like that. And uh, so 
Uh, there's been an alternative called object process methodology that was developed by Dov Dory, who's um, at, uh, in, in Israel. And so, again, here's my proposal. Okay, and I'm trying to describe to you what services thinking might be. Why don't I try doing it? And so now I have this object process. And so the notation here uh, is you have an object, which is rectangles. You have a process, which is ovals. You have ag agents handling a process, which has a dot on the end. And you have an object or a process exhibiting something, uh, either, uh, uh, either as an object or a process. And so the, the notation is pretty interesting. So the first thing I did is, okay, service system thinking. Is service system thinking a process or an object? And so, oh, it's actually a process. Mm -hmm. And so already, to me, this provides value because it's like the first thing I did, I'm just trying to put a, the first thing on the, on the slide that's like, oh, it's actually a process. Well, I drew first as an object. Okay, service system thinking community, object. Great. Okay, so then there's a relation between them. And so what it says is... Um, Handled. That's the, the agent handles the process. That's what the notation says. I can add on to that. Okay, so uh, service system thinking uh, exhibits system thinking, which we'll have to define somewhere else. It exhibits uh, service science management, engineering, and design. It exhibits general pattern, generative pattern language, and it exhibits multiple perspectives, open collaboration. So what's the significance of the direction? The arrow, uh, in this case, it says the object is exhibited. So it says that uh, system, so it says in this case, service system thinking um, exhibits so, uh, system, th system thinking. Yeah, I have to get used to the notation. I'm learning this stuff myself and just trying it out. Um, and, and so th they've been working on this for like 15 years. <laughs> And, and, and so it's one of those cases where it's like, I'm just trying it and seeing if it actually works. Janet, you have a... Uh, no, I was just trying to read the others and parse them, so... Yeah. Because I might be finding it helpful, uh, un unlike sometimes we do notation stuff, it's like, well, what does that actually mean? So this one is clear, it's rigorous, uh, they have lots of research papers on how it maps to UML, how it wraps, maps to SML, uh, uh, SysML. Um, but the, the, the point that I was trying to get in here is, okay, if I talk about service system thinking, then what is, because that's the question that people are going to ask is, what is service system thinking? And so, firstly, I say system thinking, and system thinking is a process. Uh, service science management, engineering, and design is either a community or a body of work, so it's a thing. Generative pattern language is actually artifacts, right? So they're things. And multiple perspective or open collaboration is a process. So, uh, so, so that that's those four things. Uh, and getting through those and getting through an understanding of those is going to take a, a, a fair amount of time on uh, this afternoon. So, adding on four more things: development within the community can be recognized as conversations, and there's four types of conversations: conversation for orientation, for possibility, for action, and for clarification. Uh, the work I've been doing so far has mostly been on orientation, because. When I presented this to Nkosi, um, the, uh, the response I got was, okay, this, this looks pretty good. However, the number of people that know systems thinking, uh, SSME, generative pattern language, and what multiple sex over collaboration, which is a federated wiki, is like a null set, <laughs> right? There's, like, there's nobody there that does this. It's like, okay, so I'm setting the bar high. And so that's why I want to spend time with people talking through these ideas, because I think that this is the work that should be done, and I've started working on it. But I haven't even gotten to the point where I started writing patterns yet, uh, because there are a lot of issues going uh, that, have been, that are happening along with this. So you're educating your own community as you go. You're educating us. In yeah, the, in yeah. The believes in you, but are also asking us to contribute. Yeah, to yeah. As part of the collaborative. Yeah. Community. yeah. So that so that's the um, the service um, services and think, thinking in brief, uh, because we're talking about trying to move into um, a new area. Um, and, and let me now kind of step through what each of these mean. And I'll, I'll be flipping back and forth between, um, between the slide deck and what's on the Federated Wiki. Uh, so the stuff that's is on uh, fed.coalholding.com right now. So um, on orientation, there's um, four parts I'm going to talk about. Uh, system thinking, uh, uh, SSMED, the generative pattern language, and the multiple perspectives of collaboration. 
And uh, we'll, we'll take a break in the middle, and I'll repeat the first, uh, first things again. People can, uh, can, can uh, get oriented that way. So system thinking. Um, the definition I use for system thinking is a perspective on wholes, parts, and their relations. Uh, this is um, uh, coming down through uh, Jamshi Garagadadi's uh, work. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so you have the uh, function, which is a contribution of the part to the whole. Uh, if it is a non-living part, uh, you call it a function. If it's living, you call it role, according to job sheet. Uh, structure is an arrangement in space, and process is an arrangement in time. Um, so when we talk about uh, parts and their relations, it could be part-part relations, part-whole relations. There's also the possibility for whole-whole relations, which get really interesting. Uh, so the original research by Angel back in 1941 uh, was about psychology, so people who have multiple holes, personalities inside their heads, um, there are multiple holes there. In authentic system <laughs> thinking... <laughs> inside their heads, there are multiple holes. Yeah, yeah. It's a great doodle on Tom. In authentic system thinking, uh, synthesis precedes analysis and containing holes appreciated. So uh, this is Acoff's definition. Uh, and so we're just talking about uh, function. And he says, what he says, synthesis precedes analysis. Firstly, identify containing whole, which is a system, of which a thing is to be explained as a part. Um, so uh, the usual example I have is we talk about the transit system in Toronto. Uh, are you talking about the containing whole being the city? Are you talking about being the province? Are you talking about being a financial system? Are you talking about being a production system, manufacturing? You have to define the containing whole. Secondly, explain the behavior or property of the containing whole. Well, the TTC always seems to be having complaints about service, so is that because they're not provided enough money from the government? Uh, the, the, this is the system synthetic view of it, where we would look at it uh, as, as in the containing whole. The reductionist view of this would be, well, it's probably the drivers, or it's probably the union or something like that. So, so taking a systems perspective gives you a different perspective. Ex then third part, explain the behavior property of the thing to be explained in terms of the role or function within the containing whole. So if it's being underfunded by, um, uh, by the province, then that means that the prices are going to be higher, which means that uh, people are going to be paying and then complaining because they're paying, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, my claim is that uh, th this is the test of an authentic system thinker versus the weak or poor system thinkers uh, because there are a lot of reductionists out there who claim to be system thinkers. So on, on that basis of systems thinking, um, we're I'm going to talk about service systems. Um, the camera is right there. Oh, Ken, you might want to come around to this side. I think you're right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Go that way. Okay. Sorry I set up these traps for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was oblivious. Okay. Um, so the next question is service systems, uh, and, and uh, so the history of, of service systems uh, and service system science is tied closely with the ISSS because Jim Spohr, who was at that point director of Almaden Services Research, came to the 2003 ISSS meeting in Cancun and presented about service system science there. And at that point, he said it would probably take 10 years, and now it's you know 10 years has passed, and and so. Um, uh, he had this idea that we needed a science of service systems. Uh, apart from a manufacturing uh, production economy, we need a new perspective. And so getting concrete about this, uh, because it, it's much easier, if service systems in our society um, are pretty well everything you see in civilization. Now he was on a panel, uh, he, he, Jim Spohr is currently the uh, um, worldwide director of university relations for IBM. So anyone that's ever gotten funding from IBM in the last couple of years, um, Jim Spohr is a guy that signs a check. Uh, he shows up at uh, uh, national, uh, all, these, all these national boards. One of them, he was, he was asked about, okay, if we're in a new economy, how is it that you would educate your children? Uh, and let's start from the primary school level. Uh, and so he says, well, let's start off with systems that move, store, harvest, and process. And so uh, transportation, you take a kid on the bus and you explain to them the bus system. Uh, water and waste management, you explain how water gets into the house. Food and global supply chain, uh, you know, food doesn't come out of a grocery store. Energy and energy grid, and you plug in your electricity, where does that come from? And information communication technology. So by grade four, 
uh, your kids should probably be asking for their own mobile phones and asking you know, how it works and stuff like that and give them a bigger picture. Um, then we talk about systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Uh, building and construction is a big service industry, but people don't think about building construction as such. Uh, banking and finance, people do think about retail and hospitality. Healthcare, of course, a big and pretty complicated um, service system. Uh, and then in grade nine, it says education. Uh, these students have now been in school for a long time, um, and uh, at that point, you kind of tell them why they're there. Um, finally, the most complicated are systems that govern. So uh, cities, we can kind of figure out. People pay taxes, you get garbage picked up. Uh, regions and states, uh, the ties are a little uh, looser, and by the time you get to uh, national governments, you kind of wonder where all that money goes and how the influence happens. So when we're talking about improving service systems and a science of service systems, the question would be, do we actually have a science that works across all these types of systems? So I was recently working in a, uh, in, um, a hospital situation uh, with a, uh, uh, a uh, director of transformation and and she had come over from working at a telecommunications company, and she's working in a hospital now, of course, can't get things done. And she says, you know, I've never seen another institution like this. University, like, uh, sorry, uh, hospitals are so unique, and, uh, and you know, you talk to people, they say they're gonna do something, they don't get things done, you know, the bureaucracy is really bad, and I said, and she said ne there's no other system like this. I said, of course there is. Universities are exactly the same. They run exactly the same. So if universities and hospitals run the same, why is it we don't have more cross-sharing and saying, look, uh, is there any place in, in um, a university setting we should be doing triage? Are there places where we should have clinics and structures? Are there ways of doing regional development? These sorts of things. And, and what happens is that we talk about service systems. We haven't had the experiences or had the discussion where we actually go back and say, look, there's a whole list and there must be something in common. If there's nothing in common, then we better have 13, 12, 13 different sciences, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if that was the way we did manufacturing, uh, you know, everyone would say, well, there's no, everything you learn about a car you can't use on an airplane. You know, it's got mm -hmm. land and skies, two mm -hmm. different things. So, so there's an opportunity here to be working in service systems. The definition I like for service systems, um, this one is not yet an object process methodology, but uh, it actually says what's on the, uh, on the right-hand side, is that a service system is a dynamic configuration of resources. Those resources are people, technology, organization, and shared information. A service system creates and delivers value. The value is between a provider and a customer, and the value is provided through service. Maybe a little nicer if it didn't refer to itself, a yeah, self-referential problem there. A uh, service system can be a complex system. The complex system has interactions. The interactions are an interface between provider-customer, customer-customer, and supplier-supplier. Okay, so I, I'm taking that as a definition. Now there has been a history of people from the systems community who actually write stuff that you can actually use. Um, that you know these guys actually understand systems. Uh, so so Jim Sporer snuck this one in, I'm sure. Uh, and he understands systems pretty well, so I'm okay with this, uh, with this definition. But you see the sort of things coming up, like you see resources, and you see a provider, and you see a, you know, all these sorts of things, so it's a usable start. Uh, if, if people want to change this, it's great, we can have a discussion about that, but you know, it's pretty good for now. And so these are the ones, like, so you can go through, so you can talk about the water system, the finance system, government, all that sort of stuff. In theory, all this stuff should hang together. Oh, just a clarification, is sure. everything in an organization considered a resource inherited by just saying that in that service system definition? Because processes are, can be considered inter-organizational as well as organizational. Uh, so the, the service system could tra transcend organizational boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean processes do as well. And yeah. Are, I mean, it's, I know it's not a completely limited list, but our processes in SPORS definition conceived of being a part of organizations. Yeah. yeah. For the most part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah intersupplier that, yeah. processes. Yeah, organization is, is sort of inherently systemic. It's, it's organized and organizing, maybe it's more process oriented, but it is, it is not clear the ontology of, you know, are these all things, are they? Um, right, 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 right. 
So I haven't fixed this slide in a long time, so it could, could take some work. Okay. That's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> so, so something that is new um, is, so okay, everyone's talking about service systems, and so what's new with service systems? And for this, uh, I, I went back and I started looking at Norman Ramirez's original work. So he has uh, the differentiation, uh, what's called interactive value creation. And, uh, and so I went back to the, uh, um, actually the best place to, to get this is, is probably in the Harvard Business Review article from 1983 uh, on, on, on designing interactive strategy. It, and, and I know that in there they don't actually use the phrase interactive value, which doesn't come until like almost a decade later that people start using the idea of interactive value. But with all the things that we've been discussing, the question is, okay, you know, if I leave what you say about service systems, then what's new here? Um, and so what happens is that when we talk about, uh, about uh, these, uh, these companies and what they produce, um, the idea that they, that's commonly given on, on value is like value added. That phrase comes up quite often. Uh, and, and so value added as an economic measure is actually not value, it's cost, right? So the way that you think about this is that the traditional way we think about value, you have a supplier and they buy some parts, and then you have the service provider and they add some, um, some distribution or something to it, and the customer, you know, you get a profit off the customer, right? That's the traditional way to think about it. Um, and so uh, what happens is if you look at the 1983 Norman Ramirez article, um, they talk about interactive value, and the example they use is IKEA. And, and it's actually pretty interesting, and I've had to redraw this thing like five times to try to get even the idea across. Um, but let's, let's do it this way. So we have some suppliers who are the people that supply IKEA. We have a, what I'm going to call a provider signatory, because someone has to sign a contract with someone. So this is going to be IKEA. Uh, the customer signatory, let's say it's the father of the family, uh, and he's, he buys stuff from IKEA. And you get the beneficiary, beneficiary stakeholders. So this is a family that actually uses the furniture. Okay. So the question is, where is the value? So the, va the, the service system at play is this big oval where you get co-production with the offering as input. When you buy from IKEA, the new idea was that you have to assemble it. So as the father goes to the IKEA store, he buys it, he takes it back, and he helps co-create the value. Like if he just buys it and brings it home and doesn't assemble it, then the value is not there, right? Uh, so, you, so this is what's called offering as input. And there's um, so, some other uh, dimensions about offering as input or output. But in this case, the difference is uh, that you're looking at a co-production between all the parties. Now, where is the value here? And this is the tricky part, and we'll need to be corrected on this is what uh, Norma Ramirez says is that the value is interactive between the father and the family. So if you're trying to find the value and you're looking at the person that's buying the furniture, like I hate to say if it's like me and I'm flying off, but, you know, I hardly ever see my furniture. So my family's at home and they're enjoying the furniture and so where is the value? The value that's provided is the value that I provide to my family by buying the furniture for them. And they enjoy the furniture. Right? Um, and, and so how does that happen? Well, IKEA is actually what they call the prime mover. IKEA is the one that facilitates the whole thing because they design the service system. So this, this is the hard part, and we start getting into the, um, the more recent Vargo and Lush stuff. It actually is similar and compatible with this, but it's, it, you should try drawing the Vargo and Lush stuff too, because it's, you know, you try to figure out what they're saying. There's a lot of words written about these things. But the, uh, the idea here, um, and, and the reason for focus on service systems thinking, as opposed to systems thinking or social systems thinking, is the idea of value. There's an opportunity for us to focus on value and it draws along with it a lot of the ideas of co-production and these sorts of things that we're familiar with in the systems community. We just haven't taken that extra step. Ken. David, you, you said uh, IKEA is the service, uh, service 
system producer. They're, well, they they are the what they call the prime mover. So they they are the creator of the service system or the designers of the service system. But they're also the manufacturer of the product. The they are the designers, but the manufacturer is actually the suppliers. So all all they do is they IKEA just distributes. All the work gets done contracted out, right? So whoever builds the actual furniture parts, um, they're the people that ship it. But I'd be willing to take this example outside, and, and we could talk about um, government, and, and talk about where value is created. And so, one of my favorite examples, um, having done some business architecture work in the government, is uh, is um, police and uh, security services. So the person that goes to jail is not a customer, <laughs> right? <laughs> So where is the value in having policing in our, you know, and, and you can start this sort of thinking. So the, the, uh, the value that is in the taxpayer uh, that who's willing to say, you know, I'm willing to pay taxes for policing, thinking that that's going to help their family, right? And their family's secure. And so the interactive value plays in that context as well. Of course, you may have multiple role changes. Sure. The person who actually goes to jail may, it shouldn't be presumed guilty before uh, the justice system, which is another part of that yep. a feedback loop. Yeah. In within within that whole system, that the police are have to off treat, you know, everybody pr uh, with the presumption of, of, of the, you know, the, the presumption that they are a customer, mm -hmm. in a sense, in the larger justice system. Mm -hmm. So even so, everyone does have their day in court. So the police may be serving a role, but if there are if there are civic customers, it is worth exploring those different role changes and and whether or not actually police are uh, treating individuals, you know, as if they fit a certain role just because they're apprehending someone. You know mm -hmm. that. So yeah, we could get into there are like role changes in healthcare too. That, yeah. Yeah. In a similar way. Yeah. So but so so I haven't done some work in healthcare. We once filled a, se a session, um, I was using adaptive enterprise framework, and the question was, what is the, um, what is the outcome that uh, a healthcare system provides to um, the patient? And the answer we got was, better than dead. <laughs> Which was really like, what do you mean better than dead? Is that the best you can do? And, and, and it came down to, if people do not want to live, and they actually want to die, then what do you do? Right, so you know you you help them along, but you can't actually ha commit to that outcome, and so you start getting again into value as opposed to the the, the value of the outcome, as opposed to just the the output um, from the system. Value realization. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to cover this deeply. Um, the slide deck will be available on on the web. Um, so Jim Spore and, and uh, Stephen Kwan had originally written uh, service science management and design emerging discipline. And, and the, the question um, he was asking, he, he's actually interested in what he calls a natural history of services. So the, the essential idea is that we've always had service systems in society, but we just never focused on them. Uh, so we just need to re t reorient and, and, uh, and rename a little bit. And uh, he thinks about 10 basic concepts of co-creation. You have the resources, services to entities, which are like the people, access rights. Now this is going to be something that is, um, is uh, an interesting sort of thing where you don't have to own things, you just have to have access to them. So if you look at uh, what's happened with recorded music, uh, we don't buy CDs and stuff like that. Is, would you rather buy the CD or have access to it? Uh, you know, how does that work? Um, uh, value proposition based interactions uh, where you have two parties and you start getting back and forth with negotiations. Governance mechanisms, uh, what happens if things go wrong. Uh, service system networks, the ability for service systems as parts to be able to connect to each other. Uh, a service system ecology, so you have this whole population of entities and uh, acting together. Uh, stakeholders, um, and so stakeholders, he's got customer, provider, um, uh, authority, and, um, and competitor. Uh, measures, how do you measure that, and outcomes. Um, and, and he has this model called ISPAR, which he, which he looks at that. But the, there's this whole idea of basic concepts. Have you, uh, going back to your previous diagram, tried to explain what is happening with social media in terms of like Facebook and Twitter and so forth? Because people are used to buying access to something, but in fact, you're, you're not the customer, you're the product. 
and they're getting your data and then they're marketing to you. Have you tried to analyze it in terms of this kind of thinking? I, I haven't, but we can kind of step through it right now because because uh, when you so where is the where is the co-production and where is the um, value? So the co-production is because I provide data to Facebook and Google and all these other companies, right? So they can't work without me. So there has to be co-production there. Now, who gets the value out of this? Um, and so there certainly there is the value that Facebook and uh, all, all the uh, recording companies, whatever, all the, all the uh, social media companies would get. Um, there is a value that you may get out of, it, out of the network. Uh, the alternatives, there's always the alternative, which is you could also do your own social networking. You can do your own uh, web pages, these sorts of things. Uh, I, I tend to do those myself because I don't want to give them all the value. Mm -hmm. um, so so I manage my content, yeah. but mo most people don't. I know most people don't because they don't think about it. So um, the, uh, the sort of thing is uh, uh, a, a good question. Uh, an interesting study is... Uh, Photographs, digital photographs. So uh, there's a study done by Steve Whitaker at IBM Research, and uh, what he did was uh, he he visited um, young parents, and uh, and said, okay, so let's talk about a significant event from uh, a year ago, uh, and uh, said like uh, first day of school. Did you take pictures of your kid's first day in school? Oh yes, I did. Okay, can I see a photograph, please? People cannot find their photographs in five minutes. Like it's like 90% of the people could not find a photograph within nine minutes because uh, either they, they don't, haven't done the personal management themselves or they put it on a website and then they've lost it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is one of those interesting things where uh, I manage all my photographs because I value my photographs, so I can do photographs all the way back, you know, but um, most people don't. And so are they getting the maximum value? Uh, they get more value out of the provider, so from Flickr or, or Google uh, Picasa, uh, they would provide some value to help you find your photographs. Um, otherwise, you can spend the time searching yourself. I think it's worth um, looking at. Oh, can you go forward one slide? Sure. I'm just because I have a kind of a follow-up to this question about where business our, our business models either you know drop out of this top ten or are they at, or are business models actually configurations of entities, access rights, stakeholders. Yeah. Not all the yeah. components of a business model are, are represented there. Yeah. And a business model can be described as a systemic model as a whole model as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, your question really about you know about the value in social media comes down to a business model that the user doesn't understand. They know they may be giving uh, rights away for their content, but they we have no clue as to who the different data customers are that are actually paying Facebook for access to your personal data, you know, in aggregate or even in particular. We know that they're government customers, we know that they're commercial customers, we know they're making a lot of money from both of those. But there's also advertising, and so we just have a very vague view of, of the business model. To what extent would it be helpful to be able to expose those business models so people understand how they're interacting with service systems? So I'm just a little concerned business model. Now that I think about that question of business model, I just notice I can't answer that question out of these 10 concepts. Right. Not well, anyway. I'm not sure. Well, you see, I, I, again, this is, you're speaking to the underdevelopment of the, uh, of the field. Mm -hmm. And so it should be yes or no. And like, I, I, I think it'd be configurations of this, but not all people think like this, right? Mm -hmm. And there would be some things missing, so yeah. I guess I would like. Yeah, yeah. want to actually advance that article. It's now yeah. five years old. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was just, gonna, I was just thinking, adding to, I was thinking of this model, in the business model for housing here, for example, in Finland, who want within the next ten years to have total ac uh, car ownership, personal car ownership abolished. Uh -huh. So the mm -hmm. things that you would access, for example, would be so the, the ecology and the network and the governance mechanisms, access rights. Um, but it's not clear exactly all the components that you would require. Most of it's there, but that's it's like there's another layer yeah. that needs to be understood from the person who's actually yeah. entering into that system and who has the rights to that system. Or what do you mean by rights in terms of? Yeah. Yeah. And then now I'm a part of the system. Yeah. So, so what you're actually describing <laughs> is science. 
is that we, we need the vocabulary, and so we go, okay, this is it, like, you know, or we're missing on this list, or a periodic table, or you know, whatever. But we, we need that sort of thing in, in services. We don't have that. Yeah. David, yeah. when you think about the role of uh, language to designing uh, service uh, systems, language. Language. Yeah. Uh, so the, the so service science. Um, so it's, it's, it went up and it's going down. So, so Korea is one of the countries where there is service research going on. Yeah. Um, uh, Japan, Finland, mm-hmm. uh, some in the UK. There's not much in the United States. It's like zero in Canada where I live. A big problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so there there is research going on, and so. On the, on the world, maybe. Yeah, ar- yeah, around the world. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I think that would also bring in more cybernetics, more direct role for cybernetics in communication and control flows in um, understanding the role of language. So continuing on um, on this article, so he's got these 10 uh, concepts. So it's a world's made of populations of services to entities that interact normatively and value propositions to co-create value, but often disputes arise and you have the governance mechanisms, which was said before. So uh, he has the idea of formal service system entities and also informal service system entities. So uh, the formal ones are the types you can actually contract for, uh, legal and economic framework. The informal service uh, systems is families, open source communities, all these societal things where um, you have uh, some unwritten cultural things. And so this, this tends to complicate, again, the understanding of service systems. right? Uh, and what he's, uh, Jim Spore says, we want this natural history of services entities. Um, and to get an understanding about how all that works, which we, we don't necessarily have. Uh, so the basic question is, can we create a general, serv- general theory of services and entities and networks for the through value proposition that has four parts? Um, Jim now wants me to add a couple more, uh, because originally it was service science. And then he thought, well, it's actually not correct, so it became service science management engineering. And then finally became design, and now it's arts and uh, professional policy, I believe. So, so it's like, okay, Jim, let's stop. <laughs> I'm not going to do this forever. Uh, but, uh, but the the interesting part here is the different orientations of science and trying to understand what the interests are in service systems. And so, in science, he says, uh, improve the understanding, map the natural history, validate the mechanisms, and make predictions. Uh, management conserve, uh, is interested in improving capabilities, defining progress measures, optimizing investment strategies. Engineers want to improve control, optimize resources, and designers want to improve the experience and explore possibilities, which he's always willing to discuss and argue with, so, um, so that's fine. But the, 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 what's been happening, uh, so when originally back in the vision 2003-2004 was the question that came up is, is this new service science a new discipline? And um, it's kind of like the same sort of question we get, you know, is systems science a discipline? And it's, well, you know, it's a way of thinking. We want people to think more holistically, more integratively across disciplines. Um, And for a while they were, and now I find um, they're actually starting to partition into service science, service management, service engineering, service design, and they're not coming together. So the opportunity is to bring all these back again and say, look, um, let's see if we can actually move this forward as uh, a service systems thinking approach across mm-hmm. all these fields. Um, just some more foundations. Um, this is uh, a science of the artificials. Um, Jim really likes uh, uh, Herbert Simon. Um, we have this discussion about artificial, and I said artifactual. These are man-made things. They're artifacts associated with it. So services are artifactual. Okay. So can we, um, uh, can we express stuff in intentions through this? So, so this is um, uh, the work of um, Lizanne Lazard and Eric Yu. And uh, this is the um, intentional agent perspective. What they have is, uh, is a way of modeling some of these. Uh, we have the two actors here. Uh, she says, there's, so these are two services entities. Uh, this is just a reproduction of hers, so it's not a critical view. This is just reproducing what she already had. Uh, they have high, high level interests, um, and so you have these soft goals. You have ex- expected benefits from each. You have these, this soft goal contributes to that soft goal within the person, but the dependency link goes over between the task of the other party. Um, uh, you have the value propositions, and you have the resources. 
So I don't think this is actually 100% correct. Um, and uh, Lizanne is easy to work with, so I'll, I'll catch up with her and, 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 describe, and work on some, some more of this stuff. But when we're talking about systems and the way they're modeling systems, we look at systems. Uh, I started off with this definition of system thinking with function, structure, and process, and it didn't have value in it. It didn't have the goals like this. And uh, certainly when you start looking at, at uh, resources, you're taking a different perspective on the system, right? Um, it, 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 and so my question um, going forward would be, could we use that? Um, so I've been playing with iStar uh, because um, it looks good. Um, it's used primarily for uh, software requirements, um, but, but the stuff looks pretty good. Okay, so um, let me just, for navigation purposes, let me tell you where we are. And I'll check the time. It's 2.30. Okay. So we run until what time? What time to say on the schedule? 3.30. 3.30 and then we take a break? Okay. Okay. So no, 1.30 to 3.30, two hours. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so I've, I've covered uh, what I, I, I intended in systems thinking. I uncovered um, some of the stuff in server science management and engineering design. Uh, I can flip over um, to a browser. And so here's the content on um, fed.coevolving.com. Uh, we take fedcoevolving.com. This is the standard uh, federated wiki. Uh, and I put in content here on service system thinking. I click on that. It opens up. A window. Hello. There we go. Okay. So I covered uh, server system thinking in brief. And here we have the intentional representation. Whoops. Ah. Should pop up. Click on it. Hello. Look at go. We have the intentional representation. We have the object process representation, uh, and I have that how we created that. Um, and we have the conversations. I talked about systems thinking. The part whole. Ah, not that. Okay, and I had written part of that in the article. And I talked about uh, server science management, engineering and design, um, and I have the definition from that. So uh, we're going to go next into generative pattern language. And for this, um, okay, so how many people here know the work of Christopher Alexander in pattern languages? Okay, very few. Okay. Um, so um, pattern language is more than just pattern. Um, and uh, it, it, it was used in architecture. Uh, Christopher Alexander, professor of architecture at UC Berkeley, and he created a, a series of books uh, and found a center for environmental structure uh, in the School of Architecture and Design at Berkeley. And the, the 1967 article, the Pattern Manual, was a charter. And so uh, I happened to be in Berkeley in uh, April. So I went to the library, got it, it's on the shelf. Um, open it up, it's like 21 pages, and so I opened up, it starts on page three. It's like, oh my god, someone take the first, first two pages. Uh, so then I, I, um, I photographed all the pages, I have to uh, get the content in, but um, the next day I, I sent an uh, email to the librarian and said, well, WorldCat says there's two copies of this, one's at Berkeley, one's at Harvard, can you get page one and two from Harvard and put it in? I get an email back uh, the next day, uh, sorry, an hour later from the librarian saying, Harvard is missing their copy. We're taking it off our bookshelves and putting it in the rare book collection. Mm -hmm. um, and I miss, the, the thing that's missing in the page one and two is why are you doing a pattern language? Because he actually founded a center to do pattern language. That was the mission of Christopher Alexander Center at Berkeley. Um, so I'll, I'll put some of the content up. Um, but the thing that um, I want to focus on is a pattern language which creates multi-service centers. And, th and in 1968, He's just starting up on pattern language. The most famous work that he does is in uh, 1977, which is a pattern uh, book called A Pattern Language, published by Oxford Press. 
which has become a Bible, uh, which, which is not what was intended. It's supposed to be a starter set. Um, but if, if we go back to a pattern language, which generates multi-service center, it actually um, gives a little better overview of what it's all about. Um, and so, let's see if I click on this, I actually get it, there. Um, so this is what a pattern language should look like. The idea of a multi-service center uh, was that uh, it was around government services. So if you, uh, uh, you have um, health services, your driver's license, you know, all these sorts of things, uh, particularly in poor areas, you don't have to go to five different offices if you lose your wallet. You want to go one place, right? Uh, and so in the 1960s, they didn't have these things, and so the question is, well, how would you design a multi-service center? And so he created these patterns, um, and they're linked. Okay, so uh, small target area. Uh, so you know, how big is the area that the service center is supposed to serve? Um, and so the examples they have are like you know, downtown San Francisco, a suburban location, these sorts of things. Uh, so you have the location, the size is based off the population, um, and one of the key things that he has there is community territory. This is a public space, it's both public and, uh, there, and it's, it's there with public servants, and so it's a workplace. But because it's a public building, you end up with all these sorts of features uh, about uh, arena thoroughfare. Uh, in effect, so like, if you take this university building, which is a public space, People can walk through the building, right? If it's going to be a shortcut, it's going to be a shortcut. So you have the arena thoroughfare. Um, you want the idea about small services without red tape. And so it's all these ideas of patterns are linked together. So what I find is that when people talk about pattern language, they often get lost because they, they're thinking reductively and they focus on the patterns. But what you're supposed to be doing with this is, is the hierarchy. And the way I look at the hierarchy, it looks like slow changing layers versus rapidly changing layers. So up at the top, uh, location is certainly the slowest thing. Uh, you put a, once you get a building site, that's going to be it. Uh, but when you get down to uh, outdoor seats, you know, you can put uh, outdoor seats anywhere on the property. So they're, they're faster moving. That's probably an important concept that's very similar to how architects plan buildings in terms of the uh, you know, the, the inner core, the, the site, the foundation, which are which probably very slow moving. Yeah. And then the pacing layers at, at yeah. the different levels of, of pace that are, that, you know, that, um, that can be configured as, as needed. Yeah. So, so do you, I don't, is there, you're suggesting that there might be a notation here that could help us distinguish? Well, mostly what I've done. Um, by time, you know, by their configurability or by their. Um, yeah, so, so what happened, so let me, let me step through these, uh, let me close this. And so the book had the summary, so there's an introduction, let's see what's in the introduction. And, and so this is on the web, so you can see it, so this is actually from the text about what a multi-service center, what it's all about. Okay, uh, the idea of a pattern. And so here's where you say the pattern is, uh, it's a solution to a problem in context. It's what it turns out to be eventually. So it's a design problem, the way that he looks at it. Now, if we talk about service systems, I'm not sure this is the way we want to do it. And this is, this is where I'm building up other stuff. So Alexander himself, this is 1968. You've got the 1977 work, you've got the 2004 work, and you've got the 2012 book. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Alexander himself moved on some of this stuff. Uh, the, most of the work that has been done was in the software development community and it would be in the 80s and the 90s and they froze on the idea of patterns from the 1977 book. So um, part of uh, my, uh, my quest here is to go to the, le to the people who are working in that community uh, at the PLOP conference and have a discussion with them about, okay, should we be looking at service systems in, the, in a different way? Because if we look at, at these sorts of things, it's like, well, where's the value statement? If we're looking at service systems, like they don't have... Mm. Uh, Im implicitly, if you read the patterns, they have people in them. At least you'd like to actually take the stakeholders and patterns and, and draw them out so they're a little more obvious. Uh, but let me go and go into some of the patterns. Let's see, so that's the idea of a pattern. Uh, eight buildings generated. And so he has Hunts Point, uh, San Francisco, Berkeley. Let's uh, look at Hunts Point. Maybe I should start paying for this website. 
this is this is a free website that I have this on. Okay, so here is the diagram, uh, and I colored um, the ones that he used. So uh, in yellow, they used small, small target areas, location, and size based off population, and they didn't use some of the other patterns. So the idea is that when you use, when you're looking at, okay, so let's look at the text here. So Hunts Point, 40,000 people, strong community corporation, large block worker program, 9 to 12 services, site open on three sides, so physically it must have a hill behind it, and it's near a major intersection and transit station. So this multi-service center that service 40,000 people, so the pattern is small target areas, uh, triangle sites, and then you have, you now have the linkages between the patterns. On this side, there's always side for emergency services, and so pattern three. So where's Hunts Point? Yeah. Hunts Point uh, is in the Bay Area, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, pattern 16. So what happens is that there turns out to be a few patterns that are connected to other things, and they become significant. And, I, and, and you see this actually in the 2004 uh, nature of order work where he starts talking about centers. Uh, so, um, so, the, so this is really immature at that point, but already you see some of it. It, get, it gets buried when you start working in the pattern language book itself in the, t in, in the 1997 book. Uh, arena exposure, size of the arena. Uh, the arena is buried in the heart of the building. And so this is the part when I, when I, I find that um, we start talking about pattern language. People forget about all these linkages. Um, and, and how all these things tie together. And so the idea behind doing a service system uh, pattern language would be the same sort of thing, which is, okay, is there a commonality between a hospital and uh, a university? Like, so do the cafeterias run the same way? Uh, you know, do they have to run different hours? Uh, should we think about it differently? Um, one of the patterns I found that was really interesting was um, uh, if you are going to run a 24-hour service center, there has to be a place for people to sleep because they're waiting there. So if it's a hospital type thing where you know, like people are just going to fall asleep, so there's no point saying you can't sleep here. You just have to accommodate them. Uh, I mean, there's yeah. There. I just I looked up Hunts Point. I'm, I was confused about the Hunters Point in the Bay Area. Hunts Point is in the Bronx. Oh, okay. Right. Hunts Point has actually been in the news because of um, Christopher Arnaid, who used to be a banker and now he's a photographer mm -hmm. and he takes pictures of people on the streets in Hunts Point. He's on Facebook. Very interesting portraits of people on the streets. Very corny. But interesting okay. that was mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like Hunters Point, they'll be the uh, opposite of the coast. David? Yeah. There is a pattern language for running pattern languages. Yes, that? yes, there is. Yeah, okay. It's, it's very good. Well, we see, but, but there, there's the question is because uh, is that, that was created for software development. It was. Yes. Right. And so uh, should we extend that? Should we look at it? Um, so, yeah, that, that's a place to start. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see if I go back. Uh, they have the eight buildings. They have the language. Yes. Does Christopher Alexander reuse any of these examples from the original 1968 work and the other? I don't remember that in, in the 77 book, in the collaborative. Well, in, in effect, he says they're all refinement, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you see some of the things um, uh, um, being picked up again. But, and, and, he, and here's where some of the, the confusion comes not in. that picture and not those particular, all those particular. Well, so so in the in the 2012 book, uh, which was the uh, the life uh, life for um, the battle for life and beauty on the earth, he describes uh, designing the uh, Aishin campus in Japan, and what he does is uh, he actually goes to the community and they develop the pattern language first. So the question is, what are the features or patterns that you would like to see in your high school campus? And they create a huge list and then they reduce the list. So it's not like taking the 1977 book and throwing it at the Japanese people and saying, pick your patterns. That was not what it was supposed to be all about. 
It's but generative. Yeah, yeah it's, it's generative. Yeah, and so, so that, that's where the idea, that the generative part is the hard part of all this. Um, and so, let's see. Uh, I think I flipped back to the other one, the slide deck, and go down to generative. Okay. So I, I wrote a long blog post. This is probably still at the top of the site uh, on systems generating systems, which a 1968 article. Um, and this is where you really start. If you if you read the article, you start getting into um, Christopher Alexander as a system thinker. Uh, it's pretty clear that he's a system thinker and is having problems communicating with people. Uh, but the idea, <laughs> it's like none of us ever had a problem. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and so I kind of went through this um, and uh, the four points he made, the ideas of system, there are two words hidden in the idea of system, the idea of a system as a whole and the idea of a generating system. So he's, he's actually getting beyond even the basic definition which says it, it's taking more biological bent, bent uh, that, that it generates systems. Uh, it's not a whole, it's an object, but a way of looking at an object. It focuses on holistic properties. We're going to the product interaction between parts. Obviously, so I'm thinking. Um, not a view of a single thing. It's a kit of parts with rules about the way these parts may be combined. So the kit of parts. Now, here, here is the question and, and part of the contention within the architectural. I'm not an architect. I'm reading architectural theory articles. But that seems to be controversial. The idea of kit of parts is controversial, right? Um, and, and I could see it could be kind of mechanistic, you know, um, but anyway. Um, almost every system of the whole is generated by a generating system. If we wish to make things function as whole, we have to invent generating system to create for them. So the pattern language itself is supposed to be a generating system, right? Uh, aside from the actual building or uh, structure or neighborhood or whatever it's supposed to be um, uh, built. So um, there's um, a little bit of learning that has to go when we talk about going up that curve. Uh, we talked the pattern language, talk with the summary 24. Uh, I'm going to dip, for the people that are not familiar with the uh, pattern language, I'm going to dip a little bit into uh, some of the work that's there. And so this is the 1977 book, uh, A Pattern Language, which has all the, the patterns in it. Uh, there is A Timeless Way of Building, which was done uh, at the same time, released in 1979, but it talks about how it is that you build the buildings. So this is, this is in effect, a structure-oriented book, and this is a process-oriented book. And I think that if we're actually going to do service system thinking, we could actually try to combine process and structure. Yes. It would be nice, right? Yeah, it makes sense to do that. But you need, you need a system thinker to say that, right? You go to a group of architects and go, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, like you always like to say, a, a structure is just a very slow process. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, so in 1994, um, Design Patterns, this is so, the so-called Gang of Four book. Uh, so uh, Eric Gamma, Richard Helm, uh, uh, Ralph Johnson, and John Blasides. John Blasides did IBM research, and my understanding was he's one of the guys that's driving it. So I was close enough, I had a friend, um, one of my uh, co-authors early, uh, when I was doing the systems work uh, with Ian Simmons at uh, IBM Research. And, uh, and he came to me one day and said, I have the world's best programmer working on my team. And I go, yeah, right. Well, how could you make that claim? And he says, I have John Blasides. And I go, oh, okay, you may actually have a point. Because <laughs> they talk about, John Blasides is the guy, this is IBM research. They, they have these, you know, they write these things and then they, they, they get stuck and they give it to John Blasides. And it like, comes back 24 hours later, one line of code, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So, um, but, but this is, this is the... Um, one of the top ten books in computer science. Um, and so one of the things I've been um, uh, struggling learning about recently is that computer science students actually don't know this stuff. Uh, my, son, my nephew is a, uh, um, is, uh, got a master's in symbolic science, which is computer science from Stanford. And I went out to dim sum with him and his girlfriend, who's also just graduated from the program, and all of their friends who are from the program. And they're saying, you guys ever heard of this pattern language stuff? And they go, I think I heard about that last week. You know, I think maybe I should read about it. So, so pattern language is not known again in the current generation of people, uh, which to me is very disappointing. Uh, the work has continued. Um, uh, Jim Copeland was at Bell Labs, 
uh, and, um, and he uh, had written this book on organizational patterns. And, the, and it's interesting reading the organizational patterns because they are process patterns. And so uh, as much as people think that pattern language is about writing code, this is about software development and also getting into agile, um, which uh, is a work organization. So that's kind of the history. Uh, for those of you who do not know uh, pattern language, here is an example of a pattern that uh, is well known. Number 127, intim intimacy gradient. Uh, I'll give you the, the brief description of this, which is if you have uh, a building or an apartment, you have what's called an intimacy gradient. So very few people will make it through the front door. You're going to knock on the door, there's someone there, and there's this barricade, and you know, I don't know who you are, you can't come in the house. Right? So, um, but then you have this gradient because the mailman comes, it's raining, and he's got a package he wants you to sign, come step in the hallway. And so, gets to the hallway, he's not going to get any farther than the house, he's just the mailman, right? When you have friends come over, they will come over and they'll see your living room and they'll see your kitchen often. It's a lot of good friends, you know, they'll come and hang around the kitchen, that's where all the party happens. But they, hardly anyone ever makes it to your bedroom. Very, very few people make it to your bedroom. So architects know this intuitively, and when they design their buildings, they do that. But I don't know if you've ever moved or seen a student residence where when you open the door, you look into someone's bedroom and you see their bed. Mm. It's just kind of like weird. Mm. Uh, and so that's kind of the pattern you're trying to work against. Uh, and so this, this is not a description of uh, a function or a structure or a process, or it's kind of something else. Uh, it's a feature of some way. And so... That, that's when you start getting into um, the art of writing patterns is that, okay, you want to have a building that has a nice intimacy gradient. And so even if you have a, a 600 square foot apartment, you want when someone opens the door, you don't want to see the bed. That's the sort of thing that architects should be thinking about. And you can say the same sort of thing about, um, about service industries, uh, maybe sometimes that you don't know what... You, when, when you're having breakfast, you don't want to know how the sausage is made in the back room, that sort of stuff. Right. Uh, but uh, if you look at the actual pattern, uh, the way he describes it, if you know roughly where you intend to place the wings, which are wings of light, uh, so you know how the windows are coming in, and you know how many stories you're going to have, and where the main entrance is, then you can start working on the intimate gradient. If you don't know how many floors you have in the building yet, it's still too early to be working on it. Because the bedroom's upstairs, like it's different if you would have the bedroom on the second floor uh, as opposed to having on the same floor, right? So, so you need to have that sort of structure in place. Uh, unless the spaces or the building are arranged in sequence with corresponding to the degrees of privateness, the visits made by strangers, friends, guests, clients, families will always seem a little bit awkward. And then he goes through describing um, uh, office intimacy gradient in a house um, and a formal version of the front of the gradient. So there's drawings that go along. Now, one of the things I, I see in the pattern language is uh, it is written a lot of text. Um, and I, I think this is actually not a good thing. It would be nice if we're doing a service system pattern language, if we could actually do more drawings. Uh, if we're going to do more drawings, then we get that's why we should do something to decide on what the notation is going to be, so that when these people read it, it's like you can read it more quickly and, and get a feel for what's going on. Uh, oh, here's a therefore. So here's the solution part. Uh, lay the sequences uh, so they create a public uh, entrance, public center, private space. And then what happens after you do that, then you can do the common areas at the heart, you can do the entrance room. So now these are the faster changing um, layers of things. And so the pa this pattern fits in to the other patterns. And, and so this is, this, is why, this is why when, when they were developing the design patterns book. Um, the Hillside Group was the original one, and they were d d doing the pattern language software development. They invented the wiki. Ward Cunningham invented the wiki to support pattern language. Right? So now the opportunity is Ward's got a new wiki. Then maybe we should use the new wiki for the new pattern language, which would be a nice thing. Okay, so uh, if you're looking for a place where you can actually find all of the patterns, uh, the Jacana uh, website has it, and they have higher order patterns and lower order patterns. So this actually makes it clearer what's going on um, when, you, uh, when you see it 
and, and you can go back and forth. It just gives the brief description. And interesting to be gradient um, is uh, also something to consider in social media. Um, so this one is um, Chris, I forgot the last name, I have to get this. Um, the idea is that you could design an interest to be gradient for your social media. So, so for me, um, Facebook uh, is only for family. Uh, LinkedIn is for people I've met in person and everyone else I connect to on Google+. So that's kind of the way that I do my gradients. The Hillside group uh, at hillside.net are the ones that have design patterns. Um, and um, this is where they moved the, uh, the work. Um, and they have the pattern language. Uh, Jim Copeland had written this uh, try all hardware combos. Okay, so here's the pattern language. So what makes it, so the, the, the structure, the Copeland structure for this is uh, you have a name, you have the problem, which is a design problem, the context for the design problem, the forces, which are uh, considerations that would drive you from one design to, or towards one design or another design, a solution, which fixes it, the resulting context, uh, and the rationale, so how it put all together. So uh, why is this a good pattern? Uh, it solves a problem, and so the idea is that you should actually be um, having patterns that that um, you see over and over again. And actually the coaching I've been getting uh, from um, uh, for some of the people who have experienced this is like, you should look at really old things, like look at like, like 2,000 years ago, which in services would be pretty interesting. Um, so we've had this pattern of banking that goes back 2,000 years. This is the way that people are used to handling money, and there's a reason you do this. That's a proven concept. Solution isn't obvious. Uh, it describes a relationship. It has a significant human component. Um, and, uh, and this is when you start saying all software, right? So these are software people saying that patterns should always include people. A pattern, define, a pattern language defines a collection of patterns and rules to combine them in an architectural style. They describe software frameworks and families and related systems. Um, and so that's where the Hillside group is. Now, there, there are other people using it in other contexts, but um, I'm going to the um, PLOP conference in September because these people have thought about using uh, patterns outside of the domain of building architecture. And so I'll see if I bend them a little bit and get things with service systems. Um, so uh, this, I'll probably remove this slide someday. But what happens is that there's a, a linkage between um, pattern language. This is actually written uh, by Copley and, and, um, and uh, Harrison. And so um, there is the idea of, of system thinking built into it. And one of the things I see in the writings, there, there's a pretty interesting um, workshop where they actually have this workshop about how to advance um, uh, pattern language for software development. It gets down to the end and said, needs more system thinking, kind of ends there. So uh, I think they got stuck. Um, Bernard Ulrich wrote about pattern languages. So he wrote a, uh, well, look for someone in the systems community, get credibility. He write, he did, he did a review of the timeless way of building. Um, in 2006, he wrote that. Yeah, but the book was published in uh, in in uh, 79. 79, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and and so there's some questions here about um, the quality without a name. And so this, so now the quality without a name is called wholeness or life, mostly wholeness uh, patterns that are alive. And the alive part is is an interesting discussion in phenomenology, but. The essential idea that Alexander has is that people have a similar way of responding. So there's rooms that are dead and there are rooms that are alive. And, and you know, what's the difference? And uh, a lot of the work he does is based off, um, he, he's interested in Turkish carpets. And so he has this idea where you take two carpets and which one do you prefer, the one on the left or the one on the right? And almost everyone prefers the one on the left. Um, and, and that's how he bases it. But so it's kind of pseudoscience sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, it's the idea of pattern language and this idea of against modular architecture. Now, this is something where you have to start getting really into people understand systems, because the question is about modularity and um, and the kit of parts again. Because can you assemble stuff out of this? And so the problem essentially, I think, is that if you're a reductionist, then you think it's about all the parts. But if you're a systems person, you understand what emergence is. And so you go, well, there's an emergence of the, of the combination of the parts, but most people don't understand that. So 
that's where I think you start getting in trouble with the pattern language if you don't understand system thinking. Uh, quality of learning aid. So this is from uh, Richard Gabriel, 96, and so this is quite early. Uh, but the quality of the other name is now called, um, as I said, uh, he proposed some names that ultimately confuse the words are alive, whole, comfortable, free, exact, egoless, eternal. And it's like, you know, when you're designing a, a house or designing a community or a neighborhood, how do you know it's a good community or a neighborhood? Um, this is a note that says the patterns of system thinking on the Inkosi Seabox site is not pattern language. Um, and let me flip over to the other side. I'll go back to here. And okay. Doing the orientation. Uh, generative pattern language. Okay, so we had talked about uh, the pattern language generate. So let's talk about systems generating systems. Okay, we did that blog post. Um, there is the 2012 book. Actually, let's go down here. The current applications. And so there, there, there is work on pattern language going on. There's some interesting ones. One is the uh, global village construction set. Uh, let's go over here. So here's a pattern language. If you were to recreate civilization from scratch, um, what would it be like? Like everything got nuked. And so this is pretty interesting. This is in the uh, farm area. I've forgotten where it is. This is um, Oklahoma, some place like that. But it is a group that, that is creating a pattern language to recreate society. The first thing that they've done is they created a, a brick machine. So you take, you take soil and you can build bricks, you can build bricks, you can build a house. And so that's the very first thing that they've done. Um, there is the group pattern language, uh, the group works deck. And so this is a pattern language for bringing uh, life to meetings, as they say. So. Um, when you're having a meeting, you have the intention, the context, and all these sorts of things. And so it's essentially used this for facilitation. You've used this, Peter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, we just did some dialogue around this uh, the last one. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're, we're continuing to work with different ways of, of presenting the cards in a, in a workshop form so that people can um, create their own kind of generative uh, forms out of it. So the kind of kit of art ideas in the last uh, design with. Design and Dialogue is a monthly group we have up in Toronto for exploring different modes of facilitation and group engagement. We have, um, have a lot of, you know, sometimes facilitators that will bring, bring an event that they want to try out before they take it to a conference or the public, and so it's that kind of thing. So we, we have a channel. Um, it's also something that I would recommend people look at these cards online because you can download the set uh, as a PDF, you can print them, in different sizes from the PDF for free. You can buy the deck for I think for $25 or $30. It was a really interesting group of people that put this together though. They're, they're uh, probably a group of as many as 30 um, people participating in, the, in the, the group pattern language process, some of which uh, you might know, uh, you know across like the facilitation, dialogue, knowledge management communities. So it was, and it's a good example of an outcome from a pattern language project. I mean, it, it wouldn't be bad to consider, it, it isn't that expensive to produce uh, a deck of cards. You know, there are, there are online services that you can uh, generate decks that um, that would be, you know, without even doing a large run, you might be able to get a deck like that for, you know, a custom deck for your own set of, of patterns for 20 or 25 dollars in low runs. And so that might be something to consider. So, so what I've read from Alexander, well, what, what, what I've read from Alexander, so in, in the Aishan school, they, they went out, and of course you've got all these people who are used to working in pattern language, and they go into the community and they start writing the patterns from scratch, which is tough, right? So it'd be nice to have a starter set, mm. and, I, and I, I see that's why this, this is a good idea to, to, to do it this way. Uh, there is also, let's see. It can be hard to just read through what the Alexander book it's not meant to be read. No, it's not meant to be read. Just miss so many. But the classification of types um, 
you know, eight categories or whatever in, in, in the group category, which gives you a way to sort through different types. I mean, if you're preparing a group event, you might want to look at least one pattern per uh, category so that, you, so that you've covered intention, context, or almost in sequence. And so every kind of group process you should take all those categories into account. Can I say, I don't know if I missed something. Um, but the icons here are interesting, and on the last one, the global village um, construction they talked oh, about. Oh yeah, yeah, those are meant to be meaningful at a glance. If you go back to the GV. Oh, the GV, yeah. Uh, they say icon specifications and design icon categories. So it just reminds me oh, of, yeah. of Dennis's question Is about it? the use of icons. Um, Is that a, do you know that that's a central? Uh, focus. Uh, it makes sense that as you're uh, identifying the oh, yeah. categories and patterns. The yeah, icons were, were definitely part of that their language uh, to, to create categories. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there is the liberating voices pattern language. These guys are actually so pretty active uh, on the public sphere project. And so, what is the pattern language for creating democracy? Um, and most of these are, are group, or group methods and civic engagement methods. Yes. And so these are at the, at the process level. Yeah. And then the group work step could be seen as uh, techniques and observations, practices within those processes. So I don't think they've actually been matched up together. No, no. That's a, that's a good way of looking at these. Yeah, I've actually joined the, 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 uh, the group um, the mailing list for the public sphere project, and they're a little bit lost. They just moved servers, and uh, but it appears that they're trying to figure what to do next. Because I think th so. It, it's an interesting problem. I think once you publish a book, it actually creates problems. Yeah. Um, you because expect you have continuity. Well, yeah. Uh, well, you can't, you can't revise the book anymore. People think you're done. So. Um, can, can we have like just one conversation in the room? They're talking. Yeah, you're disrupting the conversation. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we're having Sorry. I mean, if you don't want to, you know. Okay, so um, there is the Patterns and Federated Wiki. So, oops, I don't have this set up yet. Let's see if I get Michael Mahaffey. Nope, I have to link over to him. Uh, I wonder if I actually have. Probably not. No, I don't have them. Okay, we'll come back to that one later. Um, Michael Mahaffey had worked with Christopher Alexander, and he lives in Portland. So, so you were talking um, uh, about the group works project, group works projects out of Portland, Oregon. So there's a lot of pattern work that comes yeah, out of yeah, Portland. Yeah, and Vancouver. And, uh, yeah. Um, the Scrum organization patterns. Um, okay, so. So they actually just had their conference. And so, uh, so there's a pattern language for Scrum, and it's pretty hilarious. These guys do it in a, uh, a Google spreadsheets and stuff. Um, but uh, uh, Jim Copelian, who is involved with the pattern language, is now the chief methodologist for Scrum. So there's all these linkages between Wiki, Scrum, Agile, software development. All these things all kind of blog, uh, coming together. And transition as a pattern language. So this, we get into the transition towns. Uh, transition towns movement. Ah, come on. Yeah, so this is all running off the federated wiki. This, this is all on the federated wiki, yeah. Yeah, I think I have to start paying for the site because what happens <laughs> is that when you when you don't um, when you don't pay for it, then they actually uh, stop the server while you're not using it. And, and so um, I don't know if you're familiar with the transition towns movements out of the UK primarily, uh, moving to a low carbon environment, local environment. Uh, and so they developed their book on uh, uh, the most recent book using a pattern language as well. So 
the, the advice that I got when, when I started saying, well, I'm thinking about doing a pattern language for service system, they say, well, start going writing patterns. And it's like, well, maybe that's not the best thing to do. Maybe we should start reading patterns um, and then building from there because I think that it would be possible to take this work and say, look, okay, if we can even start with the 1968 book and say this is the pattern for a service center and we had to figure out how to change it. Um, part of the, um, of the supposition though, and, and, and this would be part of the uh, framing about it, is that fundamentally the pattern language is oriented around place and spaces. And so I'm not sure what the implications yet are about thinking about service as place and spaces. Well, right. I think there are things in between that, too, as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. software is a process, too. Well, that's right, and the process is to blame, too. Yeah, And yeah. like one of the slides, I can't remember why that, um, but the, the, um, what's the patterns for about a good community? Mm. Well, does that link to all the well-being? Well, yeah, well, so that, that's the sort of thing you get into. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, there's also, uh, yeah, so what's that? Okay, 3.15. Let's see where we are. Um, move back through here. You'd like to be good to refresh um, your goal for pattern language for service systems with respect to the other types. I mean, if, if you know, because you have a particular project, but uh, what would the, the call for our involvement be then with um, respect to that? So, so one, if people are interested in service systems, then, then they do a pattern language on service systems. But if people are just interested in pattern languages, there's no reason you couldn't do a federated wiki for whatever domain you chose. Um, and, and having the federated wiki makes it easy to move content across. So there could be related aspects as well. Yeah, so, so let me go to this last part, which is around the multiple, multiple perspective open collaboration. Yeah, because if those others aren't cross-linked, I mean, you could imagine Transition Town being connected to the liberate, liberating patterns or governance being linked to the group, you know, uh, the, the group facilitation, uh, group works patterns. Uh, they aren't cross-linked now, but if you have, if you have this, this federated wiki, wiki, you could create a hierarchy of those, those couldn't you? Like or are you already doing them? <laughs> okay. It's so um, nice to finally be out of the hypercard paradigm, which seems to have dominated so much on the web for yeah. so long. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is that is like hypercard, isn't it? But yeah. but the the idea that you next card next card, you know, the, yeah. the really clunky aspect to it, whereas this is very smooth. Yeah. Okay. So um, again, historically, Wiki was invented to support pattern language co collaboration, and so this is the original C2.com Wiki, which still exists by Ward Cunningham, and, uh, and you can go and you can edit it today. Uh, so it's really old technology. Uh, now, the, the, the question on, um, about whether, about how Wiki works, um, now gets down to design of inquiring systems for me. And, uh, and so there are four ways of knowing. This is um, uh, Mitroff and Lindstone, but it's based off West Churchman's work on the design of inquiring systems. There are uh, five ways of knowing in, in, um, uh, in uh, uh, the designs. And so the, the first one is uh, inductive consensual. So how do we know that something is true? Um, and uh, the example we, we could talk about here is um, if we all in this room agree the world is flat, the world is flat. Um, and, uh, and that's just, you know, that's one way of knowing. Uh, and the guarantor is that we agree. And, and this is the way that Wikipedia actually works, it's inductive consensual. So anyone who's ever had a battle in Wikipedia about content is pretty interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Early on, uh, from the society, Tom Mandel got barred from Wikipedia. Uh, and then um, he went, in, went back, back and forth, and they finally said, well, you know, if it's really true that you have all these people doing system science work, then it would be no problem to get someone else to come in and, and put the content in. And so Tom asked me to put the content in. And so, but, that, but that's what it is. It's like, it's inductive consensual. So whatever is in Wikipedia is true because these people all say it's true. Um, the second way of knowing is analytic deductive. 
This is like a scorecard where you set up a fact net. And so uh, if you're trying to find the best man for a job, what you do is you go, well, you should have these skills, have these experience, da da da. You bring them in, you score all these people. And, and that's a, another objective uh, way of ranking people. And so how do you know you got the best man for the car, uh, for the job? Because he had the highest score. How do you know you got the best man for the job here? Because everyone chose him. It's a different way of, uh, of knowing. The third way of knowing, multiple realities. Um, now we're into Kant. Uh, and so uh, this says that the data and models are, 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 are an inseparable whole. So I know pattern language one way. Peter knows pattern language a similar. We kind of both know, but we know in different ways. So you can't just take what I say and then have Peter, Peter read it and say you know, it's correct. Like it's, I mean, we all have these shadings of words that we use. Uh, the fourth way of knowing is a dialectic inquiring system. Um, and uh, the guarantor is conflict. And so in this case, uh, uh, um, you, you end up in like legal systems. Um, so in the French legal system, it is a pursuit of truth. It's not about guilty or innocent. What they're trying to do uh, is to have uh, two sides debate, and one side debates white, one side de debate black, and the observer gets to understand the gray. Um, Churchman, and actually Singer going back to him, uh, had suggested that we want to have a fifth way of knowing, which was systems approach has multiple perspectives, and that you have a guarantor, which is progress, which is that we could keep working on uh, whatever research or whatever inquiry we're doing uh, until uh, you don't have any progress. And it takes all of these other types of systems in. And so the, the question would be, if you were to invent a new type of wiki, how should you do that? And, and here's where the challenge and the opportunity is, is I believe that Ward Cunningham has created a multiple perspectives federated wiki. And what that means um, is that, um, well, well, we'll stop um, shortly, um, but it means that everyone has their own wiki and that we can copy content between them. Um, it respects that each of us is individual authors uh, it respects that when someone updates that you have linkages back to the original content. Um, and it, it's an interesting way of working. So um, let's take a break and uh, we'll come back. And so I've, I've covered um, the, the kind of the historical stuff. And now I want to get into the uh, conversation for possibilities about how we could actually move forward on, uh, from, from that history. Okay. Thank you.